God bless you, brothers and sisters. It is good to be with the people of God this evening. Uh, why don't you stand with me and let's pray so we can get started. Father God in heaven, we are grateful for this evening, Lord. In the coolness of the night, Father, we, uh, we come and we gather together to uh, seek you, Lord. We gather together in your name, Father, and we know that when we are gathered, Lord, you are here. We're grateful for your presence. Lord, we, uh, we ask you to guide us this evening, Father, and show us your goodness, your truth, and your beauty, Father. We pray for these things, Lord, because they are more important than anything, and we uh, know that they come from you. And so, God, we, uh, we ask you to dwell amongst us this evening, Lord, and be with us in our songs, Lord. Be with us as we read your word, as we study, and as we seek wisdom. And Lord, uh, allow your spirit, Father, to dwell with us and to work inside of our hearts, Lord. We look to you for all good things, Lord. We know all good things come from you. We praise you this evening, Father, and we give you all honor and glory. And we say amen.
Stand with me for this last song. Thank you. 
heart could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings Father, we love you, Lord, and Father, thou that song described of you, of the wonderful gift of Christ and his life, his death and resurrection for each one of us, not only us, but also for the whole world, that we would put our faith and trust in what he did 2,000 years ago, that one day as we pass into eternity, we would be with you. By your grace, we're saved through faith, that not of ourselves a gift, Lord. And we thank you for the precious body and the precious blood, the gift, the price that was paid for our salvation. So, Father, we thank you for this time of worship. We ask that you bless your people and bless your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you uh, greet one another, say hello, and uh, you may be seated. Welcome to you who are at home. Pastor Joe is not here tonight. Uh, He will be here on Sunday morning. So if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13 will be our text, and this evening we'll take a look at 
verses 1 through 10. Verses 1 through 10. I entitled this message this evening, Well-Advised Children. Well-Advised Children. And I asked somebody, are you a well-advised child? And they're like, well. And I, so I said, I read the definition. Uh, advise, acting in a way that would be recommended, sensible and wise. Are you well a well-advised child? So in verses 1 through 2, it says, A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. A man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. So here in this text, as well as in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 1, verse 1 starts with, A wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. So, number one, God's wisdom always speaks the truth. God's wisdom always speaks the truth. That means applying biblical principles to your life. Applying these principles to your life will cause a delight to others. Applying the word of your life. Number two, but foolishness always produces shame. It's just a matter of time. Number three, as parents... It is in our nature to want to share when our children are excelling at something. You know, we like to boast. We like to brag about our children. But on the other hand, we tend to hold back those things that cause shame. And I remember myself growing up. You know, I grew up in the church. I I grew up, I was about seven years old when I started going to church with my mom and my brother and you know, there was a point in my life where I really caused shame, where I really uh, didn't, my parents probably didn't want to talk about m- me much. But so here in the scriptures, it's starting, uh, it's stating how foolishness causes grief to the family unit. You know, obedience is blessings, but here in the text, it's, it's saying how foolishness causes grief to your family. And it happens to every family. The word grief here speaks of a heaviness and it speaks of a sorrow. And this heaviness that God knows and has, uh, he also has a remedy for it. You see, God knows your sorrow in your family unit if you're experiencing this. Because I remember putting my mom through heaviness and sorrow i remember my mom being on her knees for me and weeping so we know that this can cause a heaviness and the psalmist also experienced the same heaviness in psalms chapter 119 verse 28 the psalmist experienced the same thing he was probably going through it as we see here, he divinely prayed. And listen to his prayer. He said, My soul melts with heaviness. But he calls out to the Lord, Strengthen me according to your word. Are you there this evening? Are you, are you in pain? Are you in heaviness? Do you have sorrow? Is there something heavy on your heart? We too could call out to the Lord. For those things that are heavy in our life. And we too can call out to the Lord for strength. According to your word. So pray for your children. But also pray that we as parents would be a good witness. You see when it comes to the word of God. We we always need to take an inner look. For it's easy to look at. Out and it's easy to look at our children or the or we could also find fault with a lot of other people but we are called his children we are called his children but the question is are we listening to god are we taking heed according to his word are we following his instructions Or do we boast with pride and don't even recognize it? A lot of times 
we don't recognize, we see the sin in others, but we don't recognize the sin in ourselves. And it's very common to where you could hear somebody venting about some situation or something that they're going through with somebody. But it's very picturesque that, hey, it's about you. And we see this in Scripture also. Uh, remember the story in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 7 when David was had a wayward heart. You know, he had a relationship with God. God called him a man after God's own heart. But he did something very sinful and wicked, and then his heart grew cold. And he was just merely religious and just going through the motions. And God told him a story through Nathan the prophet about his abuse of power, his murderous heart, and his adultery. And then David recognized, man, that guy's a problem. And Nathan said, you are that man. So when it comes down to the scriptures, we always need to take an inner look, as I did this evening and then this morning. Take an inner look to see what's going on. Lord, are you trying to show me something? Lord, am I listening to you? Or is my heart dull? We see in Psalm 51 that David repented after he recognized his own sin. In James chapter 4, and verses 13 through 17, it says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will do such and such and go to such and such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell and make profit, whereas you don't know what will happen tomorrow. James says, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. But you shall say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you're boasting in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. Are you doing something that you you know you shouldn't be doing? It's sin. We know we need to confess. We need to forsake sin. We are his children. We're called to be well advised children of God. But are we listening? Do we have a sensitive heart to the moving of the Holy Spirit to conviction in our life? But pray that we do. It's always wrong to look outward without looking inward you know a lot of times we can make judgments outwardly but i if i don't take an inward look i'm hypocritical according to uh, jo- uh, matthew chapter 7 hypocrisy for if we as christians if we as christians Are not walking according to the word. We are a walking contradiction. If we say we love God and we refuse to hear his word. And we live contrary to it. We're a walking contradiction. Maybe it's time for an inner look. You know I I really need God to correct me when I'm wrong. And I'm wrong often, and, and, and we do need to take a heart check. Because God does want to correct us, and, and as our children make mistakes, we as God's children, God's people, make mistakes often. I make mistakes on a regular basis. I need to confess my sin. I need to be corrected by God. You see, when we as Christians... Don't recognize we need any correction in our life. We need, to, we need to really consider our heart. We really need to consider our heart. Are we his children? You know, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through uh, 11, it talks about if God doesn't correct you, you are illegitimate. You're not his child. But he will chasten us as it seems best to him, so that we may be partakers of his holiness. You see, we we should, as Christians, let God correct me. 
Say, God, correct me. Am I wrong, Lord? Why? Because I want to be partaker of your holiness. It says that in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 10. God corrects us so that we could partake of his holiness. You see, we're going to miss out on things if we are not uh, getting things right with God or allowing God to correct our lives. But he says in Hebrews 12, verse 11, it says, Now no chastening seems joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. Man, Lord, train me. Lord, correct me when I'm wrong. Help me to be a well-advised son who heeds according to your word. So let that be a reminder. Let's take an inner look. But here, likewise, in the text, as Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1 mentions, a scoffer, meaning a, a mocker, one who is quick to retaliate. Now, are we quick to retaliate when we're corrected? You know, so here it's speaking of, of a son who's a mocker, one who's quick to retaliate or responds with ridicule. You know, they laugh things off. You know, you try to correct your children and they laugh things off. Uh, they're contemptuous or disrespectful. And they tarnish the counsel uh, of what you say, your values. To them, they're as worthless. Sometimes you could be talking to somebody and they're, they're, they mock what you say, your values. They laugh things off. They're very disrespectful. They think your counsel is worthless. Usually those who snicker or have an attitude will give them away. It'll give them away. Are they a wise son? Are they foolish? They don't listen to rebuke. Whereas chapter 12 of Proverbs, verse 1 says, if we don't listen to and, be, and allow God to correct us, it's, it's stupid not to listen to correction. Now, the word rebuke here is a strong expression of disapproval. In these situations, when you're in a situation where you're trying to correct somebody, they're not listening, they're ridiculing, they're laughing it off, they're being disrespectful, they, they don't want to listen to your counsel, your values, uh, they deem as worthless, they snicker, they kind of like, don't want any partaking of it in these situations don't force yourself on it don't pursue it you know we really need to pray the best thing to do in moments like that or when you're trying to correct things and the best thing to do is to pray the best thing to do is to pray because your word with your words you're not getting through and you're not going to you know, God might bring them to a place where he has to bring it to their attention, just like Nathan the, prop, the prophet did in due time through a different situation. So sometimes it's just ready for us just to pray. And it's not just to pray. Prayer is, is a very uh, awesome thing that we should be praying for people. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Do not give which is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So here Jesus was speaking about pigs and dogs, and here it's a metaphor. In other words, sometimes you're going to try to give counsel and they're not going to receive it. And, and Jesus is saying, don't give it out. You know, they're going to, don't cast your uh, don't give what is holy to the dogs. You know, they're going to trample it under their foot. So it's a, and a metaphor, a metaphor for one who is of an impure mind an imp, a, a son who's uh, impudent, uh, meaning shameless, brazen and immodest in behavior. So a lot of times we have to let those who don't listen to rebuke like the story of the prodigal, we need to let them go till they come to their senses. 
like in Luke chapter 15. And I, you know, I, I think the. I think that's when when it hits you uh, the most, when 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 you come to the end and you realize how you need a savior and, you know, bring people to that place in prayer. Lord, get through their hearts. I'm not reaching them with my words, but by your Holy Spirit, you can touch them. You can minister to them and let them come to their senses. But verse 2 says, A man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. So it says, firstly here, eat well by the fruit of your mouth. So scripture teaches us that we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. Galatians 6 uh, verses 8 through 10. You know, so in the area of the tongue, Christian, be careful. In the area of the tongue, you know, I remember in my younger days, I reaped what I sowed. You know, I reaped a lot of words. I, I said a lot of words, but I remember uh, getting a lot of f- uh, fists to the face because of my mouth. So you reap what you sow. So in in a relationship too, when we're in a relationship too, we also need to be careful with our words. We need to be careful with our words uh, because our words uh, can benefit and they can be fruitful when we're communicating rightly. But we need to be careful that we don't miscommunicate because a lot of times we, we could be saying the right thing, but our body language or our mood or our tone will make everything go away. You know, I could say all the right things, but I, if I say it in a wrong tone, you know, they're not going to receive it. So I really have to be careful uh, about my words and how I share. But the scriptures tell us to be an attentive listener. Be an attentive listener. As Christians, God has called us to be listening twice as much as we speak. You know, we got two ears. And we got one mouth. So scripture tells us to be an attentive listener, uh, but an unhurried speaker because there's safety in having a guarded tongue. But as the old adage says, loose lips sink ships, loose lips sink ships or a loose mouth will find many blows. And I and I know that personally, you know, a loose mouth and I I felt many blows. So we also need to be careful of what we are listening to. It says here, the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. And some of the rhetoric that we're hearing today in the news is and today of what's happening is very violent. It's very uh, incendiary. And what we're hearing is, is combustible. You know, we see about. You know, what it, is it benefiting? Is it helping the things that we hear? You know, here it says that, the, that they're feeding on these things. But here is it. Is it helping the words, the chants? You know, it's all maybe well-meaning, but is it helping the situation? Or is it causing greater division? You know, at this time, I see a greater division in our homes, in our community, in our nation at, more than any time in my lifetime. So we need to be careful of what we're listening to as well. Verse 3 says, He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens his lips shall have destruction. And verse 4 says, The soul of the lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. So here in the text, the Bible tells us if laziness results in emptiness, diligence then produces. You know, I got to determine because the Bible speaks a lot about diligence. I got to determine what areas in my life are lacking. What areas in my life do I need that are minuses that I need to turn into gains. My, maybe it's my spiritual life. You know, look into areas 
you know, and take that inner look. You see, because we are to, whatever God gives us, we're to uh, get better at it. You know, we're not to stay idle. You know, the parable, the talents, you know, God gave them something and they had to invest. You know, and I, and I think of that of myself. Am I investing in my daily habits? Am I diligent spiritually? As Christians, we're called to be diligent spiritually, not spiritually lazy. And a lot of Christians don't want to read the Bible. And we need to pray. If that's us, we need to pray. We need to get in the Word. Be diligent about the Word. Why? Because the Bible tells us it produces a work of the Spirit in us. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says it transforms and renews our mind. It's like water it refreshes us. It's like milk and meat. It, it makes us healthy and strong. So, think about your spiritual life. Are you diligent in the area of, of, of being spiritual? Or am I lazy? Am I reading my Bible? Number two, am I surrounding myself around people who are going to build me up? Lovingly tell me the truth. Also, as a Christian, you're called to cause others to grow spiritually. You're to build up each other. So in the area of spirituality, we need to be reading and praying and re growing spiritually. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the Bible tells us, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves. We need to do those things. But how am I doing physically? Physically, because physical things matter too. Am I lazy or am I diligent? Am I eating healthy? Am I exercising? Am I taking care of what God has given me? What about my home? My garage? You know, are there areas in my life that are that need work? I, I do. That there's areas in my life that don't glorify God. I need to change. I need his help. And you know what? When I recognize it, he will help me. But I want to encourage you to about your uh, your a uh, mental stretching a mental stretching you know stretch yourself in er your area of vocabulary I'm trying to learn new words and, and and a new language and and get better at certain things and we should learn and stretch ourselves but also in the area of, of speaking and thinking you know, do I avoid a lot of political issues or moral issues? How about abortion? Do I know how to talk about abortion or moral issues or political issues? Or do I avoid them? You know, we too need to be good thinkers. You know, there, there's areas where we could get better. Instead of running, we could talk and reason. And Paul, throughout the book of Acts, reasoned with people. So it's good to listen. It's also good to ask questions where to find out where people are coming from. But verse five says a righteous man hates lying, but the wicked man is loathsome and comes to shame. And the word loathsome, it simply means it's stinky. You know, uh, uh, that lying is is, is stinky. It, it's disgusting. We should hate lying. You see, lying might seem good for the moment, but it's like filling a bag full of stuff that begins to stink and rot and fester. And eventually the bag is, this bag of lies is, is eventually going to break and cause full exposure and considerable damage and shame. You know, we're living in a day today where, you know, media and politicians I don't know. We can't uh, We almost come to the place where we don't know if they're telling the truth or not. And that's bad. Because just think what we are right now, how worse it's going to get. People are promising things and people are doing things and it's just shameful. But you know what? God is going to hold everyone accountable. Every lie. God hates lying. 
Why? Because it's not only offense to people, it's offense to God. And he's going to right all wrongs. But here, verse 6 says, A right, righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but wickedness overthrows the sinner. So scripture here teaches us that doing things God's way will keep you guarded. If you do things God's way, it'll keep you guarded. Why? Because you'll be right in his sight and blameless before others. But the after effect of the wicked brings an onslaught of guilt, woe, and endless sorrow. You know, wickedness, wickedness, you know, partaking of wickedness and lies, you know, you think you're getting away with it. And it's like, you know, somebody running with a football, ready to go into the goal line, you know, just happy and celebrating. And then all of a sudden, boom, judgment comes and that's all gone. You know, all that is for nothing. But verse seven says. There is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing and one who makes himself poor, yet has great riches. See, having riches in abundance and possessions could still leave you empty, could still leave you empty. But there is a place of contentment for the Christian with godliness where there is an unsurpassing peace, God says, an unquenchable joy, an irrevocable everlasting gains. They who find it, the Bible say, says, are truly wealthy. You know, am, am I in that place with God where, man, I'm content, Lord. You know, I'm where I want to be. You know, there's a balance. But sadly, some will look one day to an empty bag. Some will look one day to an empty bag when it comes to their pursuits what are we pursuing are we pursuing for an abundance of possessions are we trying to get rich but you see trying to be rich will never make you happy for money in the pursuit of it doesn't benefit us in the least at the end how do i know you know i've, I've done a lot of hospital calls where I've watched a lot of people die. I've done a, a lot of home visits and nursing homes where I was bedside when people go into eternity. And you see, they're not clutching for riches. They're not clutching for their wallets or their houses or their cars. They're not clutching for money. They're clutching for life. And they're trying to hold on to the things that they love and the people they love. Those are the things that matter. It's not about stuff. Stuff is okay, but there has to be a balance. But one could have little, yet have great riches. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, Paul said, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment meaning a perfect condition of life in which no aid or support is needed. Sufficiency. I'm sufficient with my life's necessities. Remember Paul. Paul was persecuted. He was in prison. And under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, uh, he said, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. You see, Paul was in prison. Paul was beaten, wrongfully placed there. And you know what? He was content. He was content. And Jesus warned us in Mark chapter 4 and, and 19, about the pursuit of riches. And he says, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in will choke out the word in the believer and it becomes unfruitful. 
So being successful isn't a sin. Being successful isn't a sin. We should glorify God in how we work and what we have. So, but we have to have a balance. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who richly gives us all things to enjoy. So the word haughty speaks of a lofty mind. Man, I'm just gaining riches so I could show off or I could be proud. You know, so the, the word is saying, you know, trust in the living God. Why? Because everything we have can be taken away from us in a moment. But am I content? See, God gives us richly all things to enjoy. In verse 8, it says, the, the ransom of a man's life is his riches, but the poor does not fear rebuke. The New Living Translation says, a rich man can pay a ransom for their lives, but the poor won't even get threatened. You know, in some cultures, it's safer to have little. Why? Because they'll abduct you and, and uh, hold you for ransom. Verse 9 here says, in the light of righteousness, I'm sorry, the light of, of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. So eventually, uh, it just seems like the wicked today uh, get away with all kinds of things. You know, it just seems like, you know, you could lie and you could cheat and you could steal. And, you know, and nothing's going to happen to you. You know, you're you're getting away with murder. You know, you have all these investigations and no one's how, being held accountable for years. You know, we have two tiered justice system. For the rich and for the not so rich or for the average. But it just seems like the, the wicked get away with evil. And enjoy doing it. And they still prosper while doing it. And you know, the, the, the psalmist in Psalms 73 verse 12 had that same idea. He was saying, well, I can't believe they're just getting away with it. They're carefree. They're always carefree. They're wicked and they're doing evil things. And they're always carefree. And they conti continue to accumulate their wealth. And the psalmist said, when I, when I try to understand this, it troubled me deeply. It troubled me deeply. And the psalmist was thinking, something's wrong with this picture. You know, they're just getting away with all these things, all these crimes that they're committing. But the psalmist's understanding of the things that he was seeing was open in Psalms 73, verse 17, it said, When I entered into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. You see, we could have and get away with murder here. But in heaven is where we give an account for our lives. But in verse 10, it says, By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well advised is wisdom. So strife is contention. Uh, strife is struggling or having a rivalry with somebody. And it happens often in the church. It happens in the family. It's like having an embittered uh, competition or an ongoing personal struggle with somebody. You know, I'm having a personal struggle with somebody. And God calls that strife or a rivalry. And it's, and it's causing bitterness. And it's, it's ongoing. It's this personal struggle. There's animosity. And there's a strong dislike. And you see this struggle that we have within us, God sees as sinful. God sees us as sinful and carnal. You see, we as Christians can be sinful. We as Christians can be carnal. 
But it shows a lack of spiritual maturity, the Bible says. When we have these conflicts and we, we, we just keep struggling with it and struggling with it, and we keep contending with people, it shows a level of spiritual immaturity. Paul said that envy is like uh, its twin sister strife. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 3, he says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. For I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. Why? Because you are carnal. For wherever envy and strife and divisions are among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? See, God expects us as his children not to behave like mere men. We, do, we are to be well-advised children. But he says envy and strife and divisions among you. You're, you're behaving carnal, Christian. You're behaving like the world, like mere men. Not my children. And again, we need to take an inner look, a heart check. Pastor Chuck said, whenever contention arises, somewhere behind it is somebody's pride. Somebody's pride is behind it. Let me read that again. Wherever contention arises, somewhere behind it, someone, someone's, it is someone's pride. The solution he poses, the solution we need for pride and strife is go to the cross and reckon the old man dead. You see, we're called to die to ourselves. And it's the only way we are going to get rid of pride. We have to die. And that's the only way we're going to get rid of contentions if we die to self. But God has called us as Christians to be well-advised children. And I, and I read that the definition, well-advised, is acting in a way that would be recommended. So here's the recommendations. There's 10 points. Number one, be a wise child of God. Make your heavenly father glad. Number one, make your heavenly father glad. Pray that. You know, if there's any area in your life that doesn't please God, ask for transformation. Get right with God and get right with people. Number two, um, lying uh, or I'm sorry, living, living Christian to be well advised. We need to be living according to his word. If we're not living according to his word, we are not his children. We're not his children. Number three, seek his wisdom daily. Seek his wisdom daily. Get in the word. It's that simple. Read a little bit of his word and then pray the word. Pray the word. Lord, teach me and change me. Help me to be like this. If you see something negative, Lord, I don't want to be like that. If you see something positive in the word, Lord, I want that. I want that. Uh, number four. Seek, seek God's help in dealing with family scoffers, family and church scoffers. And I'm going to add church in there too, church scoffers. Um, number, number five, uh, may we learn how to restrain our lips. God calls us to restrain our lips and impart God's wisdom at the appropriate time. Number six, May the fruit of our lips be pleasing to God and beneficial to others. Number seven, may I have a guarded mouth when it comes to doing anything hateful or harmful. Number eight, may we de be diligent. You know, pray to be diligent uh, in your pursuits. And in, in all your pursuits, pray that you're glorifying God. Number nine, seek to be godly and content. Seek to be godly and content. And number 10, may we have a biblical worldview when it comes to the afterlife. You know, we're also to 
forsake pride and strife. We're called to forsake pride and strife. We're called to die. You know, one of the worst things is we let the old man resurrect his ugly head. You know, the old nature, the old me. You know, don't let him resurrect. But die uh, to strife. But most needed for us as Christians, the greatest thing that we need is the help of the Holy Spirit. You know, if you're struggling in any of these areas, or if God has shown you an area in your life where there is a check mark of, man, hey, I'm not behaving as it's recommended here in the Word. You know, I, I know the Word of God don't come back void. He's, he's hitting the area of your heart if you're listening. And... You simply need to give that to God and say, Lord, forgive me in this area. And he will forgive you. But he won't leave you there just forgiving you. He will help you. And that and I think that is the greatest lack. In the church today. The transformation work of the Holy Spirit in our life, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our life and I want to encourage you this evening because the Holy Spirit is powerful and I want to be partakers like Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11, 10 and 11 talked about partaking of God's holiness maybe I'm missing out on certain things because of what I'm doing or what I'm thinking or what I think I'm getting away with. And I'm lacking partaking of God's riches and his holiness. But you see. We're only we're never going to resolve these things unless we're honest. And pray like David, the psalmist said, Lord, search me, my heart. If there's anything wicked in me or if there's any error in me, Lord, Bring it out. You know, as they put in precious metals in a cauldron, they put the, the, the metals in the cauldron and, and they, they heat it up with fire and all the impurities come up to the, to the surface and then they get the impurities and they, it's like scum on the top of the surface and they scoop them off. And then they heat the fire again and then the impurities come out and they come up and they scoop the top of the impurities and they scoop it away until the craftsman could look in the cauldron and see his face shining. You know, there's things in our life where there's impurities in our life, sinful habits, bad habits, something. And I, I need to come to God and say, Lord, refine me. Take these things out, Lord, because these things are in the way where people can't see Jesus in me. Remove these ugly things, Lord. But it comes first with that heart check. So this evening, I want to encourage you as we are well advised. You know, these are recommendations for living. You know, these are what God expects of us. But again, he will help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to live according to it. Because if we try without him, we're going to fail. But with him, man, you know, he, he gets the glory. Why? He gets the credit. So let's go to the word and pray. Father, I love you, Lord. And I, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. We thank you for your word. Father, we are well advised. Father, we have what you expect from us. But we also have what is uh, what is deemed as as error and father what you don't like. And father, if we are living in a way that doesn't please you, Lord, we pray, father, that tonight. 
Father, that we would get right with you. Father, that you would cleanse us of any error, any area that you spoke to us tonight. Any shortcoming area in our life. Father, that you would, we would come to you as children. And that we would seek the help and the transformation that we need to glorify you in our living. Father, we are your children, Lord. Speak to us, rebuke us, correct us, Lord. Not for vain glory, but for your glory, Lord. May you guard our hearts and our mouths. And Father, may we walk according to your word and not the course of this world, nor the flesh. So Father, we love you. Father, we thank you for your instruction. But also, Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would fall upon us, Lord. Father, that we would live victoriously and supernaturally uh, be transformed by your word and the renewing of our mind by the work of your spirit in each one of us lord and those at home father father we love you and we thank you for your word and we pray lord that you would help us to live according to it and we thank you father in advance in jesus name we pray amen all right amen if, if you need prayer uh, this evening, uh, you could comment. If you're at home uh, in social media, you could leave your prayer request in the comment box. Uh, also, if, if you need prayer tonight, uh, you know, there, there's some leaders here that will make themselves available for you to pray after uh, tonight's study. But, uh, you know, let's let's take the the word to heart and take it to prayer. You know, I, another thing that we're lacking um, uh, you know, we, the Lord is showing me too personally is a lot of times we hear a study and we, we, we don't meditate or we don't think about the study. Uh, we just go home and we forget about the study. So, you know, think about it, you know, maybe go, uh, back and read Proverbs 13 and, and see what God shows you, uh, there personally. So meditate on the word, you know, chew on it. It's called chewing the cud. So will you please stand and, uh, Brother Chris will lead us in another song. God bless you guys all, and uh, we'll see you Sunday morning, 10 a.m. God bless you. Let's sing about God's great love.
God bless you and have a good night.